Welcome to the Scale Up Valley podcast, where we bring the best of the best to help you scale your business from 1 million to 1 trillion. Today we have a very special guest. His name is João Lubato Oliveira, the co-founder of Lapa. João, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Miguel. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to have you and I was smiling while introducing the show uh, today uh, because we have been in touch for a long period of, uh, of time. I've, I've seen uh, the multiple stages of LAPA evolving and of yourself as an entrepreneur and as a founder and as a CEO also uh, growing. We had multiple conversations and I was smiling because of that. So let's get to know more about you. So who is Joel? And, uh, and then let us know more about the story of uh, Lapa. Yeah, Joel is, uh, yeah, I guess he's an engineer that became a PhD and then became an entrepreneur. Yeah. And that's it. And that's how Lapa uh, was born. So it was in mm -hmm. the middle of this process. So do you want me to go through, through the Lapa story? Absolutely. I think that it would be great for the audience to get to know a little bit more the story of Lapa from the beginning to okay. the exit. And congrats for, for the amazing journey. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so this started yeah, back in 2012. So I was still in my PhD with my co-founder and we were becoming a bit bored of academia and we decided, yeah, let's do something different. Yeah, pick all this the know-how that we acquired throughout these years and so we decided okay let's, let's develop this product that could help people not to lose their things and let's go crowdfund this and see how people react to it and let's yeah let's do it so we immediately started so we founded the company in august 2013 already with this crowdfunding going on so lapa is then this bluetooth tracking device uh, for you to find anything that matters, okay, from from your keys, your wallet, anything, even your kids or pets, okay. So we decided, uh, yeah, to 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 basically build a low cost GPS that could uh, run on a, a single cell battery, <clears throat> okay, and that could last for a whole year, and so we embedded. Uh, quite some features, so you could scan and beep your things uh, from a distance, such as you do, as you did, and you still do to find your phone. Okay, you have this also this safety mode functionality, so that your smartphone alerts you if you leave anything behind. You can also use Lapa with a with a button embedded on it to find your phone. Okay, even if it's on silent mode. And then you have this last seen location, which is basically your smartphone keeps recording the, the last seen position of your things. So the last time your smartphone was in contact with your things, mm -hmm. either your smartphone or any smartphone from the network of LAPA users. So this way we could, we could basically increase the range of LAPA and this to, to be broadly and basically to embed the a GPS functionality on it. Okay, so throughout the years, so from 2013 up to 2017, where we we could have our exit. So we basically sold uh, around 2,000, 200,000 lapas. Okay, to more to more than 110,000 users. So we have 35,000 active scanners worldwide. So these in more than 80 countries that we sold to. So yeah, going to the history. So uh, as, the, as I said, we started in 2013. We did our first crowdfunding. We raised $100,000 at the time. Then we got our seed round of investment. We grew the team up to yeah, 10 members. Then we went to our third, to our second crowdfunding, I mean, where we could raise 350,000. So we redesigned the, the whole product again for and released the LAPA 2. Okay. And then uh, by end of 2017, we, we were acquired by this company that was working in remote authentication 
and wanted uh, Lapa to be basically their IoT branch. Okay. From this and from this process, we basically developed this new product, which is called Lapa Card, which is uh, basically a Lapa for your wallet that you can use in your wallet for not losing it, but that you could also use it as a physical token device so that whenever you are uh, pro processing like uh, any kind of transaction in your mobile, if you are connected to your LAPA, you'd be, you have this extra level of security. That means that you are in process of this safety token. And that means you can be allowed to process this transaction. Okay. And from this process, we got hired by this, this company to, to proceed with this project. And so we, we start creating more B2B lab IoT solutions, picking up on, on all of these uh, pieces. So we basically could join from all of these. We had hardware, we had cloud and mobile as an infrastructure. And we could offer basically location, proximity, and authentication features from this uh, lab ecosystem. Okay. And so we start, yeah, basically developing different packages of, of uh, products, but more, as I, as I said, more B2B, more as a service. So we had this lap inside uh, package where we could embed our hardware in other objects, other brands objects. So you could, you could find them as you find any, any object with a lap. We had the, the LAPA token, as I said, so that any bank, for instance, could emit uh, LAPA cards. So you could use them as your matrix card, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, we had also this digital wallet that integrated with LAPA card could allow you to make any kind of payment within the, the, the LAPA card network or within a, a brand or a store, a group of stores for instance, mm -hmm. or a club. Then we also had this package of Lapa Go, where you could uh, basically geofence indoor uh, locations, indoor areas, so that anything that came in or out of this area, you'd be notified about it, such as a rent a car, for instance. And in the end, we we even developed this Lapa tracing uh, package where you could use the Lapa card as a contact tracing uh, token. So in order to help you in the COVID-19 mitigation, okay, so that you could know which people you were in contact with within your organization, so that if one gets infected, you know which ones he, he was in contact with. Incredible. And that's it. Wow. And and it comes to today. That's that's really a, an amazing uh, journey so far, and you should this every time that you tell a story, you should look to to each step of that story. It's kind of incredible uh, what you have done with with the team. It was a big journey. Yeah. <laughs> And, and congrats again for, for the journey. So this is a special episode of the Breakthrough Engineering Season in partnership with uh, IMI. And uh, usually on our um, wartime season and our normal season, we cover mainly uh, SaaS scale-ups and also corporates. And in this season, we, we cover really startups that are creating breakthrough engineering. And a lot of them have a component of hardware and software, which creates another layer of complexity. And I think it's really, really interesting for the community of uh, scale-up leaders that are uh, creating their own companies and that have this kind of complexity of needing to combine hardware and, and software. And so we always cover three critical ingredients on this show, which is radical focus, world-class team slash leadership slash culture and culture of execution. So starting with radical focus, right? So what, what were some of your lessons, some of your learning points with needing to lead a hardware plus software uh, company? Yeah, we realized it was actually very yeah, challenging yeah, because 
yeah, you have to deal with so many uh, parts of the product. So from the hardware, the firmware, the mobile, the cloud. So you have all these different components in terms of product and still you have to sell. So mm -hmm. you have to sell. And in our case, it was a consumer electronics product, which is even harder. So our right. business model, I would say it's probably the worst of all in terms of... <laughs> Congrats! Yeah, in you, terms of, <laughs> you, you executed and you exited it. So and, and you keep developing new applications to that. So that, exactly. Right. So, yeah, when we really when we realized we were yeah, basically yeah, in this yeah, in, in this very hard uh, business model, we we decided okay, we have to to change. Although we were still stuck to the to the original one, which is the traditional business model of selling one time a product to a consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, and although we did this effort, very big effort from the beginning, we could only do it successfully within the, the exit process. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, it's something that demands a yeah, huge amount of effort. And, and since you are still a small team and you want to keep focus, mm -hmm. you have to decide where to go. Yeah. So you right. cannot do both. Exactly. This is, this is a very good point, and that's why uh, usually investors love uh, B2B SaaS, because it's yep. recurring revenue and there is potential for expansion, which means that you can increase the average revenue per account of your uh, clients along the way, and you, keep, you can retain them for a long period of time. So what you were explaining to our community is really that you would need to sell a product one time to a, to a customer and you need to sell this, the product to new customers every single time. So every single month, every single week, every single quarter starts from zero. So you need exactly. every recurring revenue uh, helping you out. And so you, and you move it from a kind of a B2C uh, pers perspective to um, or B2B or in the perspective. And what you were also saying to us, which is really important and is related with the radical focus um, point, which is you couldn't do two at the same time, uh, and especially with a, in, a, in a startup stage with a, with a small team, with an edit um, team. So is, is there anything that, um, that you'd like to add on this focus? folks that are listening to us and are trying to, maybe sometimes as we discuss about in the show, trying to open a lot of geos at the same time, serving different verticals at the same time, uh, serving enterprise, mid-market, small business, uh, individual users. So we, we see these mistakes again and again and again. Uh, as your experience as, as the founder of LAPA and, and the CEO of LAPA, uh, what what would you what would you say in work for for the ones who are listening us? Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, in our case, like it was very marketing dependent because besides being a one-time product and a physical product, it was B two C. It was directly to consumer, so it was totally marketing dependent. So if you don't have the the investment to put on this and to put it ahead of selling the product, then you are basically stuck. Okay, and this just to 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 conclude the last the last idea regarding yeah the focus yeah you really have to choose your cows like you should have one milking cow and just when it gets really grown grown up and really mm -hmm. mature you can move to to others and right. for these of course you should raise an hour, another series of investment and you you should grow your team at least to double the size. Okay. Yeah, but this that's, is very important. Yeah. That's a very good point. And it's kind of the the riches are in the niches kind of uh, thought process. So in order to, yes, you need to be able to have a very big market. That's how the venture capital industry works. You need to have a, total, a, a very big total addressable market. But the way you execute and the way you create your narrative needs to be niche after niche and uh, and the, the, the niche that you are attacking this year, uh, you can be attacking five niches at the yeah. same time this year. So it needs to be one niche after another, and they need to be the leader in those niches. Uh, 
and, and I think that exactly. that's the power of a smaller company that is conquering an opportunity, and especially when the opportunity is a, a market with an interesting time, and at the same time, a time that is growing and it's becoming a huge opportunity, and we might have the top three players dominating that market, and later on, just the first one having the majority of that market is our tech, technology industry. Uh, yep. works. Interesting. And something that is also in, interesting for the ones who are listening to us is also your background. And we can we kind of kind of get into the world class leadership team culture point. But starting with you uh, personally, right? Given your product background, your engineering background, uh, what were some of your lessons moving from a product to a business? Right? Yeah, I think that was probably the biggest lesson of all. Yeah, I guess I was really an engineer that at some point became an entrepreneur or became more business oriented. And I realized that without the business, there's no point of being an engineer because you cannot put your, your creations in the hands of people using it. And this yeah, is very profound because as an engineer, if it's not sustainable, you just end up doing engineering basically because there's no one paying for it. There's no one maintaining and sustaining your solutions. And it's very tempting, like, especially if you are a creative and innovative engineer to create new products and new solutions, because that's what you really enjoy doing. Yeah, but, but you, you should always be focused on what the market wants before start doing it. Otherwise it will be just a waste of time. As I call it, and I don't know if I can say this in a podcast, but I would say it anyway. For me, it's like <laughs> technological masturbation, like this kind of thing. <laughs> I love it. That, that's why we have uh, very blunt leaders joining the, the podcast. Absolutely, you can yeah. say everything, everything yeah. that you want. <laughs> Good types. Exactly. And uh, I think that that's really a great point. And even in, in the previous point of radical focus, uh, you kind of discussed that you have some dilemmas and some decisions to make on the strategic level and the, on the focus level that were not easy at all. Right? Going at all. to B2C, no. going B2B, going to what markets, going crowdfunding, going, going pre-seed, going seed. Uh, and Maybe you didn't share too much, but there was also a huge competition on the other side of the... Like yeah, for sure. Yes, so, uh, yeah, so you struggle on all these fronts. On the first hand, you, you have all these technological temptations of doing different kind of things because you're really enjoying it. On the other hand, you have the market, like all these different kinds of people and, and potential clients wanting a piece of your thing for a different kind of solution and 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 the third point of this is that you need to sell like if you if you are not well invested then you you are struggling to sell and you are being tempted to sell on different kinds of directions and you still need to be focused so on this yeah it's it's really it's really tough on this that's why you sh you should always get well invested before before doing this this is something that should be our focus, at least in the early stages, that you you do like yeah, that you create your business to get funded, and only when it's well funded you can start doing things right, because otherwise you'll be always struggling, always running for for the money, and that will yeah that of course will create your will make you lose total focus, yeah. and that would probably was our uh, biggest mistake because we just went crowdfunding. So, and then didn't pass from the seed round. And so we were too, too small to, co to compete and to not struggling after sales. Yeah. But, and let's say that in, in, in general, you went the metrics to raise a, a series A, but some of the investors that maybe you have approached uh, saw too much risk in, in the business model yeah. at that stage to invest because you had the numbers and the metrics to go to the to the next step. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, we have two problems. The first was that we were B2C with not with without a recurring business model. So mm -hmm. it was one time business model and B2C. So it was 
two issues on the same business model and this was yeah it was very risky for them and another thing which is curious is that since we went crowdfunding and we had all these sales we had already some numbers to show and we were still raising the first rounds where you should sell more of the dream than of the numbers otherwise you get stuck to the numbers and stuck and stuck to the reality so you cannot buy goodwill Exactly. And this is quite curious and it was something very surprising to me because I always thought as an engineer that you could raise more money if you get more sales. But that's totally the opposite in the beginning, of course. Of course, after the round B upwards, it's exactly. totally different. So you get to the metrics, but till then you are selling the dream. Yeah. yeah. Still, still at round A. So uh, because that, that's a difficult combination, as you are saying, you need to show momentum and timing and a growth rate that is really appealing and that shows that there is a huge opportunity in the growing market. So you need to be able to show that you are uh, growing at two, three X when you are uh, raising. So you might get to that milestone to the 1 million or the 5 million or the 10 million, depending on series, series A, series B or, or, or series C, but the growth rate might, might take two or three years to get there. And you might be growing at 20 or 30 or 40%, which is not enough uh, for, for a, a tier one investor, right? And especially yeah. if the pool of investors that you have in your domestic markets also are more uh, conservative and you don't have uh, a lot of options. We didn't discuss that, but um, you are originally from uh, my, my country as well. Uh, yeah. And then when you started, the ecosystem was uh, starting. Maybe that's a good nuance. I think in general, uh, in Europe, uh, that's that's the state of the art. But of course, in, in cities as London, uh, Paris, Berlin, Amsterdam, uh, even Barcelona, you would see that uh, there were more investors available and, and more options to pitch to. So uh, in Portugal, in my chat, two or three options if you are not able to conquer their interest to keep investing in, in the in the in the startup you would it would be very difficult to go directly internationally to to raise around and especially at that yeah. time unless it's becoming more normal for society point nine capital invests almost all over the world and and they uh, are proud of themselves for for doing that but at that time the ecosystem was was really really different so it would be good also to have your view on how was the ecosystem at that time, because it was really the beginning uh, in, in Europe. Yeah it's, a, yeah, it's a good point, because at the time, I would say that the biggest VC we had was this government-based VC, which is called Portugal Ventures. So they were the ones that, that were leading all these rounds, at least the seed rounds, and they were getting pretty much half of the company on the seed round. So, and although we didn't get invested by them, we were, yeah, we're, we got close to it, but we didn't in the end, because also because we realize if we are giving help of the company on this first round, what can we give on the next rounds to the next investors? Mm -hmm. While we, while keeping the majority on the founders, which is also critical in the first rounds, because you have to be autonomous and, and, and this is, yeah, it's, it's critical. Absolutely. So at the time, this was the, the thing, uh, and this, it was like five years ago. And things really changed a lot on this and on the thing that you said that at the time, there were no international investors investing in Portugal. If you want to get invested by an international VC, you have to put your headquarters abroad. Yeah. And that was mandatory. Now it's coming to, it's becoming uh -huh. different. And move abroad at that time. And move so abroad as well. Especially because early stage investors want to see you in a regular basis and want to yep. be almost at walking distance from uh, from your office, if if possible. And uh, again, this is an extra cost for a company that is starting with frugal resources to just move to a city like London or Berlin or Paris. Uh, yeah, sure. High costs uh, and even the 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 need to hire people to work for your startup or scale up there uh, are even higher. And, uh, and again, you would need even more. The, and that's why in those in those cities already at that time, you had a culture of angel investors 
that would help you out in the beginning uh, before moving to a pre-seed round and to a seed round. So it was much more mature in the early stages. And of course, then the Web Summit moving to, to Portugal uh, helped a lot to put some light on, uh, on, the, on the ecosystem and yeah. starting to professionalize and sharing best practices and also having Portuguese investors going abroad, learning with other investors, co-investing with other investors, the, the, the best practice starts to being shared and we, 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 make a, a, we become a more mature uh, ecosystem. And, and nowadays we can say that uh, in, in Portugal, there, there are free unicorns, uh, Talkdesk, uh, OutSystems and Farfetch. Uh, of course, the Farfetch is the case, it's yeah. always it is in Portugal or British, but definitely the majority of, of, the, of the engineers are in Portugal. So uh, we, we can win uh, in, in, with the, towards the, we, the, the UK in that case. But of course, I'm not uh, here. Uh, someone who, who who likes to battle between countries. I think it's what is important is the world benefit from these companies. It doesn't matter from uh, where they come. Uh, and especially now that we see the diversity, we see a power on diversity on, on those companies, especially having even diverse founding teams uh, starting up the, the company. And we know that you love this, this, this topic of the world-class team, world-class culture. I think that's one of the things that motivates you the most is having a very elite, uh, strong team working together, uh, fighting to serve the customer and leveraging the opportunities. So what were some of your lessons building and strengthening the team at, at such difficult stages of the business with so much uncertainty? Yeah, what I learned is that, yeah, the, like your first team, your, your first five, six, eight man team it's like really your core team your family that you'll take to to war of this david against goliath and so they need to be good they need to be like really a plus players if you can and of course it's difficult to hire this because you don't have the money you don't have the resources so yeah of course there are many options to to for this typically you give yeah part of the company you give stock options whatever but mainly you, you have to sell your vision and they have to believe you and they have to yeah they, they have to to will the will to to join the family and be part of the family and go to war with you and that's basically the feeling yeah of working on a startup and and basically these people they prefer to be on this on this family than go to a big corporation earn more yeah because they they believe on this mission and they want to become part of it. It's really important what you just said and just emphasizing the culture elements. So having a very strong mission, strong purpose, strong vision, yep. and strong values so that everyone loves to be part yep. of, of that family, yep. of that crew, of, of, of that army. Yeah. yeah, in the so, end, it's all about changing the world, right? They exactly. want to become part of this. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's it's so good that we can't resist to not be part of that team, even if in the yeah. in the in the short term we are struggling a little bit more than what would be uh, in in other contexts. But in in those contexts, we might not have the same fuel, the same love, the same passion, the same drive, uh, and the same uh, excitement, which is really important for entrepreneurial uh, kind of people, right? Uh, like yeah. me, for instance. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's one of the of the traits of this of these people, and because they want to feel special, and they are special because they are one in a few, instead of one of many. Yeah. And it's important to see that really working against the odds. So I, yeah. I would like to repeat, and I'm not repeating in the previous episodes for a long time, and so I will do that now. Just four percent of all companies get to one million in revenue. 0.4% to 10 million and 0.04% to 100 million. So a venture backed business has the goal of going from zero to 100 million in five to seven years, seven to 10 years. I would say that a decade or even 12 years would be an amazing result. But these are the odds of what entrepreneurs, leaders are trying to, to achieve, disrupting an industry and doing a bet that in the next decade, 
there will be a new industry, a new market that is growing like ML, and we will be one of the top three players or even the leading player in that opportunity, in that new market that is being grown. And, uh, and you said something really important about the team. It's really important also to be able to show the metrics, to have a very strong culture, to have a strong narrative, clarity on the vision. Yeah. So you can bring the best people to the team <laughs> and also partner with the best investors yep. with the best of the adopter consumers so it's also important to show those milestones because it's it might it might help you to have the best investors yeah. that have and better credibility and access to a larger talent as well yeah and with with your team you need to be total transparent as well yeah as you said like share all the numbers yeah they need to be to be part of it if it, even if the numbers are the worst ever they want to be part of this worst ever number yeah, and, and they want to know this. And this is also an important part of it, of creating this family. This is a, a very good point. So um, something that I, that I have uh, founders and leaders asking me a lot is if we, should, if we should disclose the cash position number or not, especially when we are closer to the moment of going to fundraising. So when we only have six months uh, a cash flow for for the next six months or our runway is uh just of of six months what what's your take on that especially uh with your experience in clear uh stages where this can be a constant struggle right? that's a good point yeah i could say when we went for the seed round we had like three thousand euros in our bank account basically <laughs> Of course, at the time we had like two, only two people working, but still, yeah, it's it's a struggle because the, yeah, they they need to know this, and of course, maybe I I didn't tell them it was three thousand, but yeah, I said we were we had a few months and we needed we really needed to to get this run. Mm -hmm. So of course, you don't have to disclose exactly what's the reality, but you should give yeah ninety percent of the perspective or right. And yeah, and be honest about it. That's a good point. And this also shows the the personality and the culture of the people that needs to be part of a startup and even of a yep. scale up later stages. Uh, because again, at the startup, we might see the death very close, but in a scale up, the same happens. So, and at a very uh, at a higher burden kind of three or six months a way of getting out of cash before raising a series A or a series B, series C, the scale up a series B or a series C. And, uh, and, and the burn rate is huge and we might need to do a downsizing and then grow again. And this can damage a lot the culture and the trust. And, and we know that some of those companies become zombies and are not able to recover from that cultural shock. Right? So, and again, the odds, even it's it's really the growth paradox. We we all believe that as we grow, it becomes easier, but not it becomes more complex. Yeah, because there are less companies that are able yep. to, to the to the next stage. Yeah, because it's exactly the same troubles, but amplified by ten or hundreds. Yep. <laughs> exactly. So let's go to the to the last point, the culture of execution that is also very connected with the with the world class team. Bit, uh, did you have any rhythms to create this family feeling uh, to strengthen the culture and to have everyone on the same page? I know that in your case, it was much more at the startup stage, so you didn't have this problem of having 50 people or more, more people in different time zones, in different locations, offices, etc. Yeah. etc. But anyway, you need you still we still have some friction just going from one to two, from two to four people, from four to eight or eight to 16, uh, we all face the complexity of the relationships and of the alignment uh, increasing. And I'm sure that you face it as well. So what were some of the rhythms that helped you to, to work on the culture and keep everyone on the same page? Yeah, it's also a good question. Yeah, in the beginning and up to the exit, I think we were pretty much improvising. I think we were more focused on, the, on, on being one, so on being together, and, and struggling together. After the exit, like we got hired, as, as I told you, to this new company. And we still had our team for as a branch, as the LAPA branch inside this company. 
And here we start realizing we should be yeah, more structured and organized. Also because we're starting getting inputs from the main company and we are start becoming more agile and creating these agile methodologies. And these really, really, it's, it's fundamental. Yeah, especially when you are working, of course, abroad and with people everywhere and people remotely, which more or less is the, the trend, especially within the, the programming community and developers in general. It's important that you give them this remote space and you, you still need to have a framework uh, that allows you to work. And if you incorporate these agile methodologies, Scrum or Kanban, these kind of things, it really works and really improves a lot. Exactly. Yep. That's, that's really a, a great point. And something that I would like to highlight of what you just said, that is not related with the culture of execution, is, is also that sometimes we we've, we've think that the journey ends at the exit. But we, we see that there is, it is possible, for instance, companies like Zoom who go for IPO and are able to still go from 100 million to 600 million. And, and now with, with the pandemic, maybe getting to 1B pretty, pretty closely with, with incredible growth rate still, or companies like Salesforce, which is the most successful SaaS company uh, in the world at 20B plus and still growing at 25 or 30% year on year, which is, quite aggressive for a company of, yeah. of, of, uh, of that size. And even for the companies who are acquired, even for the corporates who acquire those, those companies, um, it is important to keep scaling uh, those companies. And uh, the founders might have an interesting goal, so it's good to see that you keep working on Lapa and developing new applications and, and also moving the business model to more to a B2B that was something that you envisioned and already some years ago, but it was not the right timing given the, the point of focus that we just discussed it. Great, yeah. so let's go for the, our favorite and last question of the show, which is if you would have the opportunity to meet Joel in 2013 when you were starting at Lab, what advice would you offer to your uh, younger Joel? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would tell him, yeah, don't get so emotionally attached to, yeah, to your baby. Yeah, this is something because, yeah, I think I, I stressed a lot throughout the process because it was, yeah, my creation, me and my co-founders. Uh, and this is something that you need to get a bit detached so that you can keep the focus. This is definitely one of the, of the points. And another point is really, yeah, if you have to kill it, kill it. Like if if your company, yeah, like really fail fast. Fail fast is, is something also important because you have so many opportunities. Like in our case, we spent like five years, yeah, as I said, struggling and it's the reality, like to, to gain and to sell, to pay the bills because we could not get enough funded. And in the end, we got, yeah, we got lucky to, to sell and to have an exit. But uh, yeah, still we could be doing something different with the same team beforehand and, and enjoy more of the journey, which is also yeah, important. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, I think that's, that's it's, it was a really, really great and frank conversation. I really appreciate you sharing what you think and what you feel with the community that in order to help them to yeah. uh, avoid some of the mistakes and leverage some of the lessons and also uh, leverage some of the amazing work that you have done. Thanks so much for uh, making the time. Yeah, thank you, Miguel. Thank you for the invitation. And yeah, I'm very glad to help and to inspire others to do the same better. <laughs> That's great. That's something that I'd like to, before we close the show, to highlight here. It's 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 amazing the job that Joel and the team did at uh, Lapa, and it's incredible the humility uh, because they are, at our eyes, super successful. And sometimes they, nothing that they didn't know yet how successful they are. So it, it's good to see that. And and congrats again, Joel, and to you. And to our community, we keep bringing you the best of the best to help you scale their business from 1 million to 1 trillion. 
This was a special uh, episode of the Breakthrough Engineering season with IMI. Uh, see you soon and keep scaling.